So, um, first of all, just to start off by saying that clearly the title of my talk is a play on the old saying, children should be seen and not heard. And it's interesting if you look at that saying, that dates back to the 15th century and um, was uh, coined by an Augustinian clergyman. And of course we know that in the 15th century things were really progressive. Uh, people were <laughs> still being impaled, uh, hung, drawn and quartered. The average life expectancy was between 25 and 33. And in fact, the biggest danger was surviving childhood. Um, the expression was actually coined uh, to, dis to refer to, let me, let me see now if I got that. Ah, there we go. Uh, was actually coined to refer to young women. Um, this is not a picture of the 15th century. It's a picture of the National Parents Council board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I, have, I have to get in some slag against Anya, so I might as well get it in early. So, what has changed? Okay? Some would argue that the main change regarding children has happened since the signing of the United Nations Convention on the Right to the Child, and Carmel has actually uh, referred to that. Um, the Convention is very strong in regards to, obviously, children's rights and the concepts of participation. Listening. And in fact, Article 12 is an express right that is continually referred to by the Ombudsman's Office and by many people in the rights area. How many people here have the United Nations Convention pinned on their wall at home? Come on, how many people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, very, very few of us have, to be honest with you, right? So what is our parenting influenced by? It's influenced by our own experiences of childhood, our experiences of being parents, our experiences of, of our attitudes to children, particularly our own children, our relationship with our children, our own well-being and their well-being, and of course society's views of children, which does impact on how we view children. So the question today is, why has our attitudes changed? And the second question really is, okay, it's great to hear all about the Ombudsman's Office and schools and society and maybe even governments consulting with children, but what's in it for parents? Why would we want to do it as a parent? Why would we want to consult with children? Why do we want to communicate with them? Why should they participate in the parenting process? And of course, the, the first reason, um, I suppose, sorry, there's a picture of the UN Convention for anybody who'd like to take it and put it up on their wall. Yeah. Um, the first reason is because it enhances children's development. Now, I know that's a really popular one with parents because lots of parents want to know what would make my child brighter? How will my child be brighter than the other child? So now I've given you one secret to that, okay? Which is, if you communicate and if children participate, particularly in the parenting process, then they will develop, they will, it will enhance their development. Whatever their likely development was going to be without that, and certainly if you're not communicating with children, you're not enabling children to participate, then it will impact on their development. And how do I know this? Well, psychological theory supports this. So what do we know about development? We know that in general terms, we know that you can break up stages of development into stages. So not to two would be viewed as the sensory motor stage, um, three to seven, the pre-operational stage, eight to 12, the concrete operational stage, and 13 to 18, the sensory motor stage. Of course, everybody in the room already knows this. Where? Yeah, sure. So this comes from work by Piaget, which is pretty old at this stage, but nonetheless has stood the test of time. Why is this important? Because what it gives us is a general sense of what you're likely, your child is likely to be able to do at certain ages. Now, I know the Ombudsman's Office will be very strong on this and lots of people in the rights area are very strong on the fact that you can't apply a child to stages or vice versa. So I'm not suggesting today that every child fits into this and that children of particular ages are not capable or are capable because each individual child will be different. But as parents, having some sense of the developmental capabilities of children is important. And the reason for that is because, number one, if we have too high expectations, we often give children more freedom than they need or can, can deal with, and that creates insecurity. But if we have too low expectations, we are inclined to smother our child, to overprotect them, and therefore they're disempowered. Of course, 
the real lesson on this one, on the cognitive development side, is that our child will develop at their own pace. And we won't have a clue about that unless we communicate and, 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 and engage with our child to find out what their capabilities are. Likewise, participation is key to this as well. Being able to give children an opportunity to participate gives us some sense of where they're at in their development and also enhances those developmental stages. So if you look at the sensory motor stage, having awareness of what's immediately in front of them, developing the concept of object permanence and early language development. We all know, anybody who's a baby will know the importance of engaging at a communication level with little babies. Society has a confused attitude to this, of course, and that doesn't help parents. So if you look at the legislation impacting on children, there are many inconsistencies and discrepancies. For example, in Ireland, the age of digital consent is 16. The age of criminal responsibility is 12. So that places parents in a difficult position because we're not even clear at a policy level what exactly do we think children are capable of. We're going to see the playing out of a uh, case that everybody's aware of now in the next uh, few months of a 13-year-old accused of murdering a 14 or 15-year-old. This is tragic. But these are going to raise questions for us as a society about what we should expect from our children, what their capabilities are, what their developmental abilities uh, are, and what responsibilities they should take. Of course, in terms of parenting, it also creates confusion because even though we know innately as parents that, for example, babies that are crying are trying to communicate with us. We are nonetheless bombarded with people like myself, psychologists, uh, different uh, policy makers who present us with other concepts. So it's not so long ago, in the last couple of years, where we heard about the fact that it's better to actually ignore a crying baby. And that's a new parenting theory. And that children who are ignored will develop discipline faster and all that sort of stuff. And yet, we know innately that with babies and with children, that that type of communication is vital and is the start. If we respond to a baby who's crying, we learn about communication, that, that baby will become an infant who knows that their parents will respond to them and that communication is so important. In terms of school, I, I, how many teachers have we here? Yeah, many teachers will be able to tell us how we we know, for example, that children who are maybe up to age seven, they, they don't grasp rules, so they need supervision. Try put a group of six-year-olds or five-year-olds together to play a game. Very hard for them to stick with the rules. They don't grasp that concept. And yet in many schools, we still expect, we put in lots of rules, and we still expect children under seven to adhere to those rules, even though they're, they're not supervised by adults. So again, inconsistencies. Um, the second key thing about communication and participation is it has a serious impact on social and emotional development. Um, again, there's lots of theories around this. So Erickson is probably the one that I, I favor. He talks about eight different stages of psychosocial development. And he talks about what the tasks are for children, the developmental tasks during those particular stages. So not the two, it's about hope, and the key issue is trust versus mistrust. So a child at that stage is learning about trusting. They are completely dependent effectively on a parent to meet their core needs. And if they don't develop trust at that stage, it's very, very difficult to develop trust later on. Child between two and four, it's about autonomy and shame. They're developing their own will. Four and five, it's about purpose, initiative and guilt. Five and 12, it's about competence, industry and inferiority. And between 13 and 19, it's about fidelity, identity versus role confusion. confusion. So a healthy developing person you're expecting will deal with these, will develop these competencies, will resolve these issues as they move through childhood. And again, it's very clear that communication and participation are key to this. Without communication and participation, it is likely that children can start to run into serious difficulties around these type of psychosocial uh, um, blocks that build on each other and that they will have an impact as a child moves forward and indeed becomes an adult. What Ericsson is telling us is that for a child to be emotionally healthy and to be an emotionally healthy adult, he or she needs to develop a strong sense of trust and self-value as a young child. He also needs to have developed 
a sense of self-confidence, to allow him or her to take chances, a sense of an ability to achieve, and a sense of positive self-image. All of these are enhanced through communication and participation. Secondly, and probably the thing that at the moment is most important to me, is the fact that communication and participation are very important to a child's mental health. Again, this should be a very positive message for parents, and probably one that the people certainly in this room who are motivated to come in on a beautiful Saturday and listen to people talking are clearly already engaged in understanding and trying to enhance their parenting knowledge and abilities. But nonetheless, it's amazing how, particularly when children run into mental health difficulties, and I think this is probably correct when children run into any sort of difficulty, we forget those core principles. So Carmel talked about bullying and said, you know, one of the key things about bullying is you talk to children about the resolution of bullying. And in mental health, that's equally as important. Because some of the time, and I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about it later, we panic. And so all the consultation and all the participation and the communication sounds great until our child says, I'm feeling very depressed. I'm feeling very sad. I don't want to go into school. I have no friends. I feel my life is horrible and terrible. And suddenly we, the communication barriers start to build because as parents we go, oh my God, I've failed. What have I done wrong? How have I missed this? What happens if I better do something? And we forget to go back to that next step, which is, I wonder what my child thinks would help. For children to be mentally healthy, they need to feel loved and safe. They need to learn how to be happy, to build emotional awareness and psychological resilience. They need to have self-belief. And they need to be able to meet emotional health challenges. And again, communication and participation play a key role in all of this. This slide here, which I hope you can, yes you can, um, is what I call the emotional health bucket. And it just, I suppose, identifies some of the key things that feed into those, that sense of self-belief, that sense of being able to be happy. When I say being able to be happy, that's a really interesting one for Irish people, I think. We find it difficult sometimes to admit that we're happy. You know, what would you do if you won the lotto? I'd hate to win the lotto because it would destroy my life. <laughs> I personally would take the chance, but there you go. <laughs> Having self-belief. Any Americans in the room? Okay, I'm not insulting you now, okay? Just so we start off here, right? But if I, I've done talks, as, as the chair has said, right across the world. And if I say to an Irish audience, can somebody tell me what you're good at? Very few people put their hand up. If I say to an American audience, can someone tell me what you're good at? Loads of people put their hands up. And that's a culture thing. And it's about self-belief. And in fact, Irish people take the, sit back and go, oh, I can't believe your man's after putting his hand up. <laughs> so when I ask this question now, you Americans better not put your hands up or you're in big trouble, okay? Um, and by the way, I like that T-shirt, which I, which I was noticing earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Of course, when a child starts to experience mental health difficulties, communication enables them and us to assess why these might be occurring and to find the right responses. A child's participation in the solution process is also essential, otherwise it will simply not work. I spend most of my time talking to parents about children's mental health. I get calls every day. My child is really anxious, won't go to school, is wet in the bed, it's really bad. And when I ask the question, have you spoken to your child about this? Parents usually say no, to be honest. And I don't blame them, that's not a criticism. That's a natural reaction, because parents think, if I raise this issue, is it going to make it worse? If I hear stuff I don't really want to hear, what am I going to do? And also, um, you know, this is an area I just haven't got a clue about, and I'm really worried that something bad's going to happen, so I need to intervene really fast. And so they phone somebody, and that's reasonable. But when they have that conversation, the solutions start to emerge. And no one's su suggesting that a child in fourth class or fifth class can say, can find a solution necessarily. But they will give a perspective that will be really key. They will outline what's causing the problem. And they will give a sense of what they think might improve things. And that helps us to build a solution. We do a competition every year among the schools. We ask primary schools and secondary schools to be part of this. And there's two parts, there's two competitions. One is to ask them to do a, a film, and the other one is to uh, 
apply and explain all of the mental health initiatives they're doing within the school. And we're, a, we're a mental health organisation, but very, very quickly we realised that if you're going to be effectively intervening in schools and, and trying to get stuff that really does work, it has to be driven from the children themselves. And in the first year or two when we started this, people were sending in stuff, really classy stuff, but they were all done by the teachers and the parents, and it was great. But they realised themselves as well that, in fact, the message is coming from the kids. And there's lots of things about that video that people might go, well, you know, are the messages clear enough? But they're very clear to the kids. The kids themselves saw the messages as clear. Um, One of the key things around communication and participation is this concept of empowerment. And empowerment of a child plays a key role in not just keeping them mentally healthy, but also indeed in terms of helping them develop, um, develop healthy, and also in terms of this concept of citizenship. And what do I mean by empowerment? Well, the first thing is ego, okay? So they need to have an ego. Coming back to this concept of, and useful to ask ourselves, do we have ego? as parents. Second one is meaning. We have to give them meaning in their lives. Okay? And we have to understand what their meaning is. Um, a young lad who smacks a guy on a football pitch, that means something different. That is being driven by something different from an adult who smacks somebody on a football pitch. And so understanding their lives and understanding their behaviour requires us to explore with them about meaning and that's best done through communication and participation. Personal autonomy speaks for itself. Ownership. When you sp speak about rights, and Carmen will tell you this, everyone always says, what about responsibilities? And ownership is a nice way to really conceptualise both of those things. So they have rights, but they also own their decisions. They own what they're doing in their lives. Um, very important. Welfare. That they are able to and that they have got physical and mental welfare and that they understand about that and that we understand the importance of that. Enthusiasm and energy, really important. Enthusiasm for life, energy to participate in stuff, energy to be engaged in their lives and in the relationship with us as parents. And then lastly, the concept of recovery. Communication and participation play a key role in keeping children mentally healthy. One of the big misunderstandings for people is that when you talk about mental health, the assumption is that people will always be mentally healthy. But one in four, one in five people will have a mental health issue. One in ten children will have a mental health issue serious enough that they will require specialist help. So as parents and as children, it's useful for us to prepare for the fact that we will experience mental health difficulties. But what extent they might be is not, it's hard to tell. It's determined by our personality, by the sort of social and emotional issues we presented with, by the sorts of supports we have. But, and the reason this is so important is because very often when children experience a mental health difficulty, parents feel guilty. They feel they've failed in some way. I was at that talk by Paul Gilligan and he told me to do this and I've done it and, the per and I'm still now facing into a situation where my child is experiencing emotional issues. But the most healthy perspective is to say, well actually, Communication and participation are going to help me to deal with this, number one. And number two, this is not unusual. This is something that we can work through. And so recovery and having a recovery plan and understanding that children and adults can recover from mental health issues is really important to empowerment and having a, having a way to do that. Um, so how do we do all this? What are the principles behind communication and participation. And this slide I've tried to uh, demonstrate three things. One, the principles around communication. Two, the principles around good participation. And three, I wanted to deal specifically with the issue of discipline. Because aside from the crisis that can hiss parents around um, mental health and um, health, uh, etc., or difficulties that arise as a result of maybe a death or whatever, one of the biggest issues for parents is this concept of discipline. And one of the areas where communication and participation probably break down the most is at, the, at, at that position when they are confronted with discipline problems or believe they're running into a problem with their child's behaviour, etc. Um, 
before I move to that, uh, I just wanted to pick up one other issue that uh, Carmel talked about. The third and most important part of communication and participation is, of course, this concept of a right. And so citizenship uh, is something we need to always keep in mind. But I think from a parenting perspective, rights are very important to talk about, but it needs to be conceptualized in a, in a sense that you are enhancing your child's individualism. You are recognizing that they're a unique person, that they uh, will develop in a, a unique way, that they have got rights, and they have a right to be themselves, to be individual, to be unique. And therefore, communication and participation enhances parenting because it enables us to let our child develop that uniqueness. And that involves, of course, recognizing their rights, but it also is key to citizenship. Um, so let's take the first couple. Listening with genuine ears, with understanding and respect. I know that the National Parents Council do a whack of stuff around uh, good listening skills. I'm not going to go over that today, but listening is a really key skill. And with children, it's a really important one. So a child will say things, and it's not just about what their words are, it's also about what the interpretation of that is, what meaning we place on that. Really important. Asking questions and reflecting back what we understand we are hearing. Seeing beyond negative statements to hear what is actually being said. Taking responsibility for our own feelings and wishes, and where possible, telling the truth. So, what are the obstacles to good communication? Disrespect is one. Um, failing to listen, being too dogmatic, saying one thing but showing another through our actions, jumping to conclusions, and making assumptions and secrecy. So I know we're tight on time, but I just want to go back to the exercise I gave you earlier on. How many people here found it easier to find the thing they wanted to improve rather than the thing they did well? Hands up. Hands up high. Okay, so 50% of the room. Okay. Many people found it easier to identify the thing they were worried about rather than the thing they did well. Hands up. So one of the biggest obstacles to communication and participation is parental confidence and anxiety. I would take the view, and we don't do any, any, um, any measures of this, but I would take the view that parental confidence is probably lower than ever before in terms of generations, and yet parental skill and ability has never been higher. And the, the, the small pieces of research that are available tell us that we spend more time with our children, quality time with our children now than, than our parents did. Our children most likely will do better educationally, in terms of health, mental health, than generations before us. And yet parents generally feel anxious about their abilities. And that's because they're barraged with stuff. People like me saying you should do this and you should do that. The media saying you should do this, you should do that. It's awful, look at the mobile phones. How many people here are worried about mobile phones and children? <laughs> Everybody, see, yeah? Okay, so this is the new thing now. So one of the big things, one of the big blocks to communication and participation is anxiety. It's about worrying, and it's a great thing because we want our children to do really well, but we worry about our abilities. Are we giving them enough time? What are they doing when we're not with them? Our phone's gonna damage their lives. Is the internet gonna damage their lives? What about academically? Am I putting them under too much pressure? Am I not putting them under enough pressure? Will they be, do well, et cetera, et cetera? We really need to contain that. Um, participation. We need to be clear about the purpose, what it involves and how it impacts, and, and uh, Carmel talked a lot about this. Uh, we need to give our children age-appropriate, relevant information. They need to consent. They need to participate on their own terms. They need to create a child-friendly environment. It needs to be democratic and non-discriminatory. Um, the biggest mistake we ever made as parents was we consult our children about where we go on holidays. <laughs> They're now in their 20s and we still consult them about where we go on holidays. Um, don't consult your children about where you go on holidays. <laughs> no, no. But where do we go? I have no idea, you better ask my daughters. <laughs> don't know yet. Um, discipline, crucial one. Communication and participation, really important to this. Modeling good behavior is key to this. Talking about decisions, listening to resolutions, influencing a child to think about the rights and wrongs of situations. 
helping a child through support and guidance to control their behaviour. Um, my message today is twofold. One, I'm not here to make people feel bad about what they're doing. I'm actually here to, to reinforce what you're doing. My experience and the fact that people are here today, as I've already said, indicates that people are doing a really good job. <clears throat> they know, everybody in this room knows that communication and participation are important. My message is that there, there's something in it for us as parents and for our kids. They will develop more healthy if we, if we communicate with them and we encourage their participation. They will be mentally healthier and we will create citizens that will take that sense of citizenship right through to their adulthood.